Let's pray together. Lord, it is good to lift our eyes, to lift our hearts, to lift our voices to you. For when we get our eyes off of ourselves, we have comfort and hope and help. You are our anchor. You are our rock, our defender. We look to you as the sovereign over all the nations, the creator and sustainer of the earth and everything in it, the coming king who will reign obviously, physically, manifestly on the earth. Lord, we pray that our hearts would be aligned with yours, that as we look to your word this evening, we would think the way that you do. We are so tempted to be independent in our thinking, independent in our knowledge, think our own thoughts. And we've already seen where that road leads. There's a way that seems right to a man, but the end is death. With you, with your thoughts, with your ways, we have life. And so we pray now as we open your word that by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would soften our hearts, that you would open all eyes, that you would make every ear hear from you. And we ask this in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, it is good for us to sing And we put our hearts and our minds around the things that are true, uh, the things that unify us together as we lift our hearts towards God. We're making our way through Israel's songbook, the book of Psalms, in the middle of our Bibles. Now, we find ourselves this evening in Psalm 14. I would invite you to turn there. And as you're turning to the songbook that is in the middle of your Bible... I will make mention of the world's songbook. Our world is full of songs. People write and sing and perform songs all the time. I'm going to read the lyrics to one of the world's songs that was popular when I was in high school. And it's funny when you read lyrics without the tune. Sometimes the, the tune of a song makes the words seem so compelling. I think this song reflects the, the, the view of life and a view of mankind apart from God's thinking. So just by way of contrast to what we'll read in Psalm 14 tonight, here is Sarah McLaughlin. Adia, I do believe I've failed you. Adia, I know I've let you down. Don't you know I tried so hard to love you in my way? It's easy. Let it go. Adia, I'm empty since you left me. Trying to find a way to carry on, I search myself and everyone to see where we went wrong. Because there's no one left to finger, there's no one here to blame, there's no one left to talk to, honey, and there ain't no one to buy our innocence, because we're born innocent. Believe me, Adia, we are still innocent. It's easy, we all falter. Does it matter? Adia, I thought that we could make it. I know I can't change the way you feel. I leave you with your misery, a friend who won't betray. I pull you from your tower. I take away your pain. I show you all the beauty you possess. If you'd only let yourself believe that we are born innocent. Believe me, Adia, we're still innocent. She doesn't really sing it that way. I'm just getting ramped up here. It's easy. We all falter. Does it matter? Believe me, Adia, we're still innocent. How many times does she have to say this? We're born innocent. Adia, we're still innocent. It's easy. We all falter. But does it matter? Because we're born innocent. Believe me, Adia, we're still innocent. It's easy. We all falter. Does it matter? Believe me, Adia, we're still innocent because we're born innocent. Believe me, Adia, we're innocent. Are you convinced? No. (laughs) If she says it enough times... And, and it's, it's an irony to say, we all falter, but we're innocent, we're innocent, we're innocent. We're born innocent. I made mistakes, you made mistakes, but we're innocent. Why couldn't we work it out? We're innocent. It is a tragic irony of the human condition, especially the human condition that doesn't look Godward, but looks selfward, and then proclaims, we're all good, it's all good, nothing to see here. The song we'll encounter tonight in our Bibles is God's assessment of the situation. And those who live declaring that there is no God and those who live as if there is no God 
find themselves in a deep well of moral corruption, which blinds the judgment. We're looking this evening at atheism in the songbook of Israel. We're looking at the problem of human depravity, total depravity, universal depravity in the songbook of Israel. Again, the song starts like the others do, for the choir director, a song of David. So what we're about to read was designed by God through the sweet songwriter of Israel to be sung collectively. And we're not going to sing Sarah McLaughlin's song. We're going to sing this song. There's no one who does good, not even one. It's quite a contrast. Look down at your Bibles and let's read this song. The wicked fool says in his heart, there is no God. They act corruptly. They commit abominable deeds. There is no one who does good. Yahweh looks down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there is anyone who has insight, anyone who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. Do all the workers of iniquity not know who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon Yahweh? There they are in great dread, for God is with the righteous generation." You would put to shame the counsel of the afflicted, but Yahweh is his refuge. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion when Yahweh restores his captive people. May Jacob rejoice, may Israel be glad. What we have here in this psalm are the attraction and danger and remedy of atheism. Psalm 14 and its twin, Psalm 53, deal with this topic. Psalm 53 is nearly identical to Psalm 14, except for the last stanza. And it deals with what corrupt men believe about God or don't believe. Theism is the belief that God exists. Atheism or atheism is the belief that God does not exist. And a related term, agnosticism, is the claim that I do not know if God exists. It comes from agnosis, or I don't have knowledge, ignorance, pleading ignorance. And when we talk about atheism this evening, I, I don't want you to let yourself off the hook as an agnostic or as a theist in thinking that atheism is only relegated to those who demand that no God has ever existed, and I know it to be true scientifically. The atheism described in this psalm is not only that philosophical type, but it is also the practical atheism that lives as if God does not exist. It's the kind of lifestyle that just sort of puts the horizontal blinders. You know, a racehorse has the vertical blinders, so I can't look side to side. The practical atheism puts on the horizontal blinders, so I never look up. I just want to live at the horizontal level, go about my life as if there is no accountability, as if there is no divine standard, as if God does not see everything I think before I think it. That's a practical atheism. And it falls as well under the banner of the atheism described in this psalm. Let's talk first about the attraction of atheism, and I think we see this in the first three verses. Let's read it again, and I'll explain what I mean by the attraction of atheism. The wicked fool says in his heart, there is no God. They act corruptly, they commit abominable deeds, there is no one who does good. Yahweh looks down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there is anyone who has insight, anyone who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. Together they've become worthless. There is no one who does good, not even one. What I mean by the attraction of atheism here is, is there is an attraction to living your life apart from God, or living your life as if God doesn't exist, or even making the philosophical formation that God doesn't exist. And it's attractive because such a view allows one to live how one wants to live for self. And we'll talk about the relationship between those two ideas. It is also attractive because it's easy 
And it is also attractive because everybody else is doing it. There is a, a peer pressure of approval to live as if God doesn't exist or even to declare that God does not exist. Look at verse one. It is the wicked fool who says in his heart, the word for fool there is the word Nabal. And if, if you know your Bible, you, you may have remembered that David himself encountered a man by the name of Nabal in 1 Samuel 25. Uh, this man was an aggressive, irreverent drunkard. He mistreated people. He didn't care about God. Uh, he was even eager to mistreat uh, David, who was the promised king over the nation of Israel. And Nabal, as a man, was the epitome of the Nabal fool that is described here. It is a, it is a wicked fool. It is an irreverent fool. It is, it is not just a silly person but as someone who is aggressively antagonizing God. And notice he says in his heart that the wicked fool has thought these things out, has ruminated internally. The fool here is, is on a spectrum either of a simpleton or a maniac. And, and to call one a, a fool here is to recognize that, of course, all sin is folly. But atheism is the apex of foolishness. Imagine what it takes for a moment to actually be an atheist. And, and just to let the cat out of the bag, I do not believe, and God does not believe, that there are any actual atheists anywhere. But what would it take to actually be an atheist? One would have to be eternal, omniscient, and omnipresent to legitimately make the declaration, there's no such thing as a God. You would have to have been from all eternity past into the present, into all eternity future, everywhere and perceiving and knowing accurately everything that can be known in order to make the declaration, there is no God. You'd have to be God to declare there is no God. It is frankly an audacious claim and not credible. There is no one who has the credentials to actually make that claim and be believed. It is on that grounds alone, simply an insanity. And it is arrogant to deduce by logic or some other means of rationality if one is not eternal, omnipresent, and omniscient. If one simply deduces from the facts available that there must not be a God, it is an arrogant view of one's ability to logic this out. First of all, because it's not true. But secondly, because it assumes from a very limited capacity in a very finite being that one could make such an audacious and consequential claim that one is frankly not capable of making. Atheism is not an answer. Do you understand that? Atheism is not the answer deduced from the facts. Atheism is, in fact, a lens. Atheism is a lens through which one looks at facts and comes to conclusions. The Lowell Observatory is in Flagstaff here in Arizona. It's named after a famed astronomer, Percival Lowell. Uh, Lowell theorized the existence and location of Pluto long before Pluto was discovered. Pluto was actually discovered 14 years after Percival Lowell's death. But by mathematical computations, he was able to determine its precise location. He was a very accomplished astronomer. He spent 15 years of his life from 1893 to 1908 mapping in detail the extensive system of water canals on the planet Mars. Very detailed maps that he published. They were evidence for him of an advanced civilization that had carved out these water trenches and canals to support uh, an advanced form of life on Mars. Other astronomers of his day were not seeing what he was seeing, but he was convinced he knew what he saw. And his 15 years of drawing out these detailed maps as he peered through his telescope and recorded what he saw. 
And what he found at the end of his life was he had mapped out the blood vessels on his own eyeballs. His eyeballs had been reflected onto the glass of the telescope and then projected onto the planet Mars. And he had drawn out those maps of the blood vessels of his own eyes onto the planet Mars. He wasn't seeing what was true. He was seeing through a lens. And atheism is a conclusion, not deduced, but assumed, that becomes the lens which interprets all facts. It projects onto data the thing that is wanted to be seen. The truth is found in Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare or scream out, loudly proclaim the glory of God. Romans 1 is clear that God's eternal power, his divine nature, have been clearly seen from what has been made so that men are without excuse. All men look at the data externally. And all men interpret that data based on the condition of the heart. This is why the fool says in his heart, there is no God. It is internal. It becomes a lens through which he sees the world. And that lens interprets the data. Turn to Romans chapter 1. We'll be in Romans a few times this evening because Romans, Paul's argument in Romans depends heavily on some of the observations made in Psalm 14. But looking at Romans 1, beginning in verse 18, we discover there that God's wrath is being revealed from heaven against ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. And, and that's sort of a, a normal frame of thinking about the God of the Bible. He, he's holy and he doesn't like sin. But notice how the unrighteousness of men is described in verse 18. They suppress the truth in that unrighteousness. There is a relationship between corrupt thinking and corrupt living. There's a symbiotic relationship between what you think about God and how you live. If you believe that God is personal and holy and you're accountable, that affects the way that you live. If you want to live a different way, change your theology. Or if you don't believe the theology, you will inevitably live another way. Thinking about God, thinking about ourselves, and then living are inextricably related. And notice this, verse 19. How could Paul say they're suppressing the truth? Because that which is known about God is evident within them. Psalm 19 talked about an external testimony of God's existence. Romans 1.19 talks about an internal testimony. God made it known within them. And then verse 20, back to the external. For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. That is a universal testimony seen by every human who has walked God's earth and being understood through what has been made. Listen, even the committed evolutionists talk about design. Now they'll credit evolution with the genius of it. Even Richard Dawkins credited the genes with the unbelievable capacity to know where the evolutionary development should go. And he wrote about the smart gene that made the, the giant leap of the Cambrian explosion. Of course, Richard Dawkins changed his own view later in life and gave credit to aliens when evolutionary time frames were not long enough to account for the Cambrian explosion, nor for its instantaneous appearance in the rocks. And so some extraterrestrial life must have been responsible for all of the life on the earth. It really is remarkable that God's assessment of the situation is that these things have been clearly seen and they're understood from what has been made. In other words, there is a maker and there is stuff made. Verse 21, even though they knew God, they did not glorify him as God nor give thanks, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools. What is God's view of atheism? No such thing. And it's an insanity to claim. The atheist is taking the truth of God in the universe and the truth of God in the heart and stuffing it into a box, closing the lid and trying to sit on the lid while the stuff inside the box is too big for the box. 
Nothing to see here. There is no God. There is no God. There is no God. Kind of sounds like Sarah McLaughlin. We're all good. We're all good. We're all good. God's assessment is the opposite. Now listen, it is a madness to deny what you know to be true. But it is an easy madness. And this is why I think that atheism is particularly attractive. Notice in verse 1, they act corruptly, they commit abominable deeds, there is no one who does good. There's a connection between the second half of verse 1 and the first part of verse 1. The fool says in his heart, there is no God. They live corrupt lives. This is an easy motivation to, to, to portray or live in the madness, the insanity of atheism, either atheism proper, there is no God, or atheism practical, I'm living as if God doesn't exist. It is easy. And you're either motivated by the corruption to erase God from your thinking or motivated or freed up by an absence of God in your thinking to live a corrupt life. I want to live life for myself with no accountability. Therefore, I'm going to believe there's no God. Or, I don't believe there's a God, so I guess I'm just up to myself, free to live how I want. Not only is atheism easily motivated, it is also easy in its manipulation. It's manipulation of truth. It's manipulation of thoughts. Listen, a wrecking ball manned by one guy in a machine can tear down a building that it takes thousands of people to construct. Tearing things down is easy. Being a philosophical deconstructionist is a piece of cake. Just ask questions and let it go. This is the genius of the freshman philosophy classes, the freshman religion classes at the state university. Uh, the professor with tenure and all the credentials and all the information and all the big words can just poke holes. He, he doesn't have to build anything. He can say, can you have an, uh, an immovable lamppost and an unstoppable cannonball? And what happens if you fire the unstoppable cannonball and it collides with the immovable lamppost? See, God doesn't exist. Have you heard that one before? Can God build a rock so big he can't lift it? You say your God can do anything. Can he go out of existence? All of these are philosophical conundra that a professor can stand up and just ask, and he doesn't have to have answers. Just deconstructive wrecking balls to ideas. And it's so easy. you got a philosophical conundra, and you can't answer it. Therefore, there must be no answer. Well, that's not where the truth lies. The truth does not lie in my puny brain's ability to have a ready answer to a silly question. It's no threat to the truth. It is no threat to God's existence when somebody who eats God's food, stands on God's earth, breathes God's air, and is sustained at every heartbeat by God's will when he says, oh, there's no God. It's no threat to God. This is not only an easy madness, but it is also a contagious madness. Listen, indulgent, godless living loves company, and therefore it loves approval. Back to Romans chapter 1. This is where the chapter ends. Those who practice such things are worthy of death, but they not only do these things, after giving a long list of, of uh, moral crimes... But they also give hearty approval to those who practice them. And listen, you know this in your own life. When you're busy about things that are not pleasing to God, you, you want company in it. You want other people to do it because their going along with your lifestyle approves your lifestyle. You, you, you sort of get courage against God when somebody else agrees with you. No matter how corrupt they're living or thinking. And we don't stop to ask the question, should I be asking that guy's maker what he thinks about that behavior? Or should I just get with my buddy and say, hey, we can live corruptly together and it'll be fine because there's company. Again, this madness is contagious. Then we get to God's assessment in verse 2. 
Yahweh looks down from heaven upon the sons of men to see if there is anyone who has insight, anyone who seeks after God. And the answer to this, of course, is th there is no one. Verse 3, no one who does good, not even one. They've all turned aside, all together become worthless. That's God's answer to the question. Is there anybody? Is there anybody? And, and we understand that naturally speaking, apart from grace, apart from God's kindness to recalibrate thought by supernatural working in the corrupt human heart, no one still would be seeking after God. No one still would be doing anything good. And listen, we, we grant relative good. You understand a, a corrupt human being can help a little old lady across the street. It's better than not helping her. That's only relative moral good. That is not the kind of good that God describes here. He says without faith, it's impossible to please him. The kind of good we're looking at here is the kind of good that seeks God, that seeks to please him, has the vertical component of faith to it. I'm going to help a little old lady across the street for the glory of God. Relative good doesn't meet God's standard. God's assessment is they have all turned aside. Together they've become worthless. Genesis 6, 5, God's assessment is there. Every intent of the thoughts of the heart was only evil continually. The, the phrase in verse 2, Yahweh looks down from heaven, is reminiscent of Genesis eleven five, 5, when God had to come down to see the great big tower that man had made in his rebellion. Or of Genesis 18, 21, when God looked down upon Sodom and Gomorrah, and what, what is God's assessment as he looks down uh, from heaven upon the sons of men to see if anyone has insight, if anyone seeks after God? There are no seekers. I know people like to talk about seekers. Oh, I'm on a journey. I'm, I'm working through all the religions of the world. I, I'm seeking after God. If you want to seek after God, he's revealed himself in his word. He's there. He's findable. But frankly, apart from God's drawing, there's no seeking. God will get the credit for all of this, all the people that come to him. In verse 3, the assessment continues. They've all turned aside. Together they become worthless. The word worthless there is the, uh, the word for something having turned sour. Galophobia is the fear of milk. I don't know if you have that fear. Uh, I have that fear. Uh, Acerphobia is the fear of things turned sour. Uh, I really have acerogalophobia, the fear of sour milk. And you can ask my college roommates about this. In fact, one of my roommates warned Janet, who is now my wife, watch out for Smed. Uh, you'll be halfway through a bowl of cereal and the milk will disappear. It'll be back in the fridge. But they were right. Somebody left out a gallon of milk and I knew I, I wanted to have a, a cold milk over cereal, but I the, even the thought of the hint of the slight whiff of the faint odor of maybe it went sour would turn me off and I'm done. Can't do it. And, and you know how when, when milk's been around a little while, the milk in the jug might still be good, but around the, the nozzle at the top, it just, uh, I have a low tolerance for these things. It is a legitimate phobia. And this is the, the picture of the, the sourness of humanity. And, and listen, we can't smell what's gone sour because it's us. We're accustomed to it. We've, we've normalized it. The, the sinful rebellion against God and humanity loves company. It only makes sense that in Romans chapter 3, when Paul is making the case for total depravity and universal depravity, he quotes these three verses out of Psalm 14. In fact, turn there to Romans 3. In Psalm 14, David is making a, an assessment and an appeal to God on the basis of Jews in Israel who had the word of God and lived corruptly. Some of whom in David's circles may in fact have said, no, there is no God. Some of them may have just been living as if Yahweh didn't exist and they didn't care. And David's looking around from a, a small batch of a remnant of people who actually love God at, at a corrupt world around him. 
And Paul picks up this language in Romans chapter 3 to assess the entirety of the human condition. Verse 9, what then? Are we, the Jews, better? Not at all. We've already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. In Romans chapter 1, Paul indicted the Gentile world for their depravity. In Romans chapter 2, Paul indicted the Jewish world and the religious world for their hypocrisy and depravity. And just in case we didn't get the picture, Jew, Gentile, there are no other categories. He goes through a whole litany of Old Testament quotes, starting in Psalm 14. Verse 10, he says, There is none righteous, not even one. No one who understands, no one who seeks for God. They've all turned aside. Together they've become worthless. There's no one who does good, not even one. And he goes on and quotes other texts. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of vipers is under their lips. Their mouths are full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery ruin their paths. The way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. This is God's flawless indictment of the human condition. God is to be believed. Jew and Gentile alike are all under this universal, that is, everybody's guilty, and total depravity. Total doesn't mean you've always done everything bad you possibly could have done out of your potentiality. But total depravity means that this sin infection has affected every aspect of the human constitution. It's not just the outward deeds. Jesus said it comes from the heart. It's your thinking. It's your rational ability. There is no neutrality in the human constitution. Either you have been born again and you love God, or you're at enmity with God from the heart. You think wrong. You feel wrong. You do wrong. You're motivated wrong. That's what total depravity means. Every aspect of who humans are is affected, infected by sin. And the point David's making in Psalm 14 is, is the Israelites around him were corrupt. And Paul takes up his language to use that as a window into the universal human condition. David felt the corruption with particular wicked people in his day. And God confirms that that corruption is total and universal. That is the attraction of atheism at its root. The attraction is that it is just totally natural for us. <laughs> Either to declare outright that God doesn't exist or to live as if he doesn't. And notice next the danger of atheism. It begins in verse 4. Do all the workers of iniquity not know who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call upon Yahweh? There they are in great dread, for God is with the righteous generation. You would put to shame the counsel of the afflicted, but Yahweh is his refuge. The danger of atheism is that the atheist will one day meet the God he denies. Don't they know, David says? They sin with impunity. Look how David describes it. They are workers of iniquity. They eat up my people the way they eat bread, and they don't call on Yahweh. The picture here is, is one of devouring people as casually, as easily as you eat your bread in the morning. You eat your Cheerios, you sin. You, you have your tortillas at lunch, and you ruin people. It just comes easy. It's, it's what they do. They, they don't think about it. They're, they're not troubled by it. They have normalized wickedness. They justify it. They make it legal. Maybe they even celebrate it and they think nothing of it. In our day, you think of the audacity of the murder of the most vulnerable in the womb done as easily as taking a pill or removing an unwanted clump of cells. It is remarkable the human condition that does so easily what offends the holiness of God. And they are in danger. The danger of the atheist, either the practical atheist or uh, the, the professing atheist, is that they are in God's hands as they spite him. 
They, they are seriously being held up and sustained by God's power as creator and sustainer of the universe. And standing, as it were, in his hand, they slap him in the face, they spit at him, they mock him, they tell him he does not exist. Uh, the danger of this insanity is a danger at a suicidal level. It's like when you're climbing Mount Emerest, I don't remember the last time you did that, and you went hypoxic and you removed your oxygen mask. You were low on oxygen and you thought the solution is, I need to not be breathing out of this bottle anymore. It's when you go so hypothermic that you take off your gloves, you take off your boots, you, it somehow makes sense all of a sudden to put your feet in the snow. Maybe when you're scuba diving and and, and you've built, had the buildup of, of toxicity in your bloodstream and it affects your brain and you think the smartest thing you can do is to remove your regulator out of your mouth. This kind of insanity makes sense in the moment and it is suicidal. And so the atheist, while being supported and sustained by God, derides him, tells him that he doesn't exist. How do you think that's going to go? Look at verse 5, there, or the word here could be then, they will be in great dread. Literally in the Hebrew, they will dread a dread. It's a way to kind of give a, a big superlative idea. They will be really scared. They will dread greatly then and there when God takes his stand. Have you ever been wrong and been wrong when you fought vehemently, convinced that you were right, and some little fact emerges, and you just get that knot in your stomach, the, the, the pit in your gut, and you're like, oh, man, I was wrong. Can you imagine the eternal depth of that awful feeling when you wake up recognizing you were on the wrong team? You had lived for self when all the while you were accountable to God. When you should have lived for God and then received everything by His grace. What a tragedy to realize it only too late. Listen, in the end, if God be against you, who could possibly be for you? Verse 6 describes the danger further saying, you, the, the, the wicked ones, you would put to shame the counsel of the afflicted, but Yahweh is his refuge. Remember when Nebuchadnezzar said to the, the, the Jewish youth, he demanded that they worship his image, and if not, they'd be burned in the fiery furnace. And he says in Daniel 3.15, what God is there who could deliver you from my hand? It is a taunt of belief from a position of power and superiority and earthly authority. Literally, n n no human, uh, no force, no conceivable thing could have gotten Azariah, Mishael, and Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, those guys, out of Nebuchadnezzar's hand at that moment. He was totally in charge. And audaciously, arrogantly, he said, what God is there that could deliver you from my hand? Who showed up, by the way? Jesus, before Bethlehem, before he came to earth as a baby, he was there with them. He rescued them. The reality is the righteous might feel alone in the midst of a crooked world. They might feel alone when they are mocked and mistreated. The, the atheist intelligentsia, the, the Richard Dawkins of our day, the Christopher Hitchens of our day, the Bertrand Russells, who is no longer of our day and has already met his maker, may mock, may scorn, may confuse. They might answer questions we can't answer. And they will all meet God. And verse 6 says, God is his people's defender. Yahweh is the refuge of the afflicted. The wicked might feel good in good company, 
for now. But each one will stand alone before God in judgment. Again, we're not off the hook if we're thinking, oh yeah, those terrible atheists on YouTube that do all those debates and stuff. That's them. Psalm 14 is all about them. Truly, any time we sin, even in the Christian life, we're, we're living out a form of unbelief, a form of practical atheism that lives as if God doesn't exist or that he doesn't care or that I can just go about my business the way I want. And there's always a danger in that. It, it's attractive. It, it is a danger. We need to see the end of the psalm because there is also a remedy for atheism. In fact, the whole world will be cured of its atheism in one fell swoop. Look what the psalmist points to. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come out of Zion. When Yahweh restores his captive people, may Jacob rejoice and may Israel be glad. This is a look towards Messiah's rescue of his people. David speaks of a future restoration. Uh, this idea of captivity it is a word that can mean the, the fortunes are restored. It was used of Job at the end of Job's life in Job 42 uh, when God put everything back together in his life. Sometimes it carries the idea of a captivity. And we might ask, what captivity would David, the songwriter, be talking about? Now, when David was king, Saul had been king before him, Solomon was king after him, and Israel was not under captivity. What is this all about? And, and you could point to a couple seasons of David's life where the people of Israel that were the remnant faithful who loved Yahweh were under oppression by wicked oppressors. And you can think about David's own life under Saul, and you can think about David after he was king when he had to flee Jerusalem because of his son Absalom's treasonous revolt. So there are a couple instances where you could hear David's heart saying, oh, we, we need our fortunes restored. Things are going bad right now from evil people. Other commentators have said this is a prophetic look to a future rescue of Israel. Charles Spurgeon uh, refers to the time when Messiah comes to restore Israel's fortune, to set God's people free. And, and then Jacob will rejoice. Yahweh will restore his people. In fact, salvation for Israel coming out of Zion is promised in Zephaniah 3. Zephaniah says that very thing. Yahweh himself will come and he will restore Israel's fortunes and he will set them free from their captivity. Turn to Romans one more time this evening in Romans chapter 11. We know that this, the, the longing of this psalm will be fulfilled when Jesus comes back. Listen to Romans eleven twenty six. All Israel will be saved. By the way, the word for salvation in verse 7 is again Yeshua. Now, that's the name given to Jesus. Jesus will be Israel's salvation. Just as it is written, Paul writes, Romans eleven twenty six. 26, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will remove ungodliness from Jacob. There, those same words are used. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. There, of course, Paul is talking about the future restoration of Israel when they believe the gospel and are rescued from their enemies when Messiah comes the second time. And you know that Messiah's coming happens twice he arrived about 2,000 years ago. Israel's Messiah came. He's truly the rightful king. King not only of Israel, but also king of the whole world. He was rejected, maligned, spit upon, mocked. Anybody who's a follower of Jesus today and is being mocked by the atheistic intelligentsia, listen, you're in good company. <laughs> it's all right to be there. You don't even have to have all the answers. Jesus is the answer. He'll take care of it. He'll be your defender. And when he came the first time, he was maligned, misunderstood, and murdered. Here's the king, the one that's come to bring peace. And he was not loved because he also brought a reign of righteousness. That is a, a life of conformity to what is good. Jesus, when he came the first time, says, this is God's judgment, John 3, 19, that men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. 
There it is, that, situ- that uh, symbiotic relationship between corrupt living and corrupt thinking. Why did they not love the light? Why did they love darkness? That is an insanity. That is epistemological suicide. That is the desire to live according to my own thoughts, no matter where they lead, even if the end is death, I'll take darkness and destruction and death as long as I don't have God telling me what to do. Why did men love darkness? Because they loved their evil deeds. And Jesus came to rescue us, not only from those deeds and from the consequences of those deeds, but from the corruption in our heart that produces the love of those deeds. If you're here this evening, if you're listening to this psalm, you need to know that if you're infatuated with corruption and you're using atheism or agnosticism or practical atheism as an excuse, as a crutch to live the way you want to live your life, you can be rescued from that hopelessness, from that darkness, from that road that goes nowhere, from that futility. And it simply means coming to the light. Yes, the light will expose evil deeds, but the light in Jesus forgives those evil deeds, buries them in his love, and removes them from you as far as the east is from the west. This is the gospel that Jesus came to earth to die on a cross to actually pay for sins. Sometimes we're so afraid, I don't want God to tell me what to do because then my life won't be any fun anymore. Listen, your life's not fun now, no matter what the veneer looks like. And Jesus came to rescue you from all of it and forgive you for all those times you stood in God's hand and slapped him in the face. He'll wash it all away. He'll make all of it look white like white snow if you will surrender to him. And the gospel is good news because God is willing to treat us not as we deserved, but as Jesus, the perfect one, deserved. He's willing to give us his righteousness as a free gift on the basis of faith. You believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for your sins, and you get as a gift a perfect record. It's amazing. It's the message of the Bible. That's what it's all about. To reject that good news in the hope that maybe it's not true, maybe there's not a God, maybe I won't be accountable for what I've done, even though you already know God exists and you've already violated your own conscience and broken your own rules. That's a bad gamble. It's a suicidal insanity. But you're alive on God's earth right now and you're hearing these words and there is opportunity for you to turn and believe the gospel. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you that there are no atheists and that you already know it. That gives us such confidence that when we talk to our friends, when we talk to to people that we meet, and they claim an ignorance, they even claim a, a profession of your non existence, we know that you know that they know that you exist. So we trust you. We trust you that when we walk out in love and proclaim your love to a world that needs your love, that you will actually bring people to new life through faith. You did it for us. May you do it for countless more before you take us home. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.